part of changing. One of the hard parts is you don't always get it right. Like this offering that was supposed to be between the first two songs in the middle of it. Right? Anyone catching that? Right? Just a quick note, uh, Don had come up to me before service and mentioned this is going to be their last Sunday uh, with us here. That it wasn't that long ago that we thought we were sending them off and then we got news that they were going to be able to stay longer, had to stay longer because I think they're ready, ready to go to the next chapter. But uh, today is that day um, that is their last time with us before they are sent off. To the next chapter and the next scene of living and um, what made me think of that right away was Tony saying and praying for the thankfulness for the saints who have gone before this next season that we're entering into the heart, the soul, the mind of this body and what it's been um, and we're just thankful for you guys and your service uh, to God through this body. calf or something like that, you know, we get cake, we do that right, but, um, man, we're going to be missing you and celebrating you, and your stories will live strong here um, as we continue. I think we're feeling the sub-theme, I'm not sure which is the sub-theme and which is the main theme of this morning, but definitely the sub-theme of just kind of the chaos or the craziness and change and how hard it actually is. It was funny, when starting the series, I talked to my good friend Rachel Statt, who is a tried and true fit body, uh, fit body boot camp um, guru, or I guess soldier, might even be the best way. That She regularly posts on Facebook, it's like 4.30 a.m. or 5 a.m., and she's up and she's checking in, and she's getting after it. And one of the most interesting things um, in her experience, in uh, and actually doing one of the workout sessions is there's two people that are kind of leading it. One person has the headset, and the whole time you're working out, they are just Mr. or Mrs. Positivity. Just building you up, telling you, you you can, reminding you that you can, encouraging you and telling you what a good job you're doing, keep pushing, you know, that kind of thing. And the other one is actually instructing, here's what's coming next, but they also are for you as you are giving yourself and giving your life in the fit body boot camp kind of way to becoming a new you. And I think it's, it's very informative of what it's really like to make a new you. To go after uh, becoming someone different than you currently are, the change, being willing to go after that. That I, don't, I think it is the brokenness uh, it would be sin in this world that brings in all the negativity and the bad self-talk that's trapped in our minds that lies to us. Again, like we've talked over this series a lot about our identity and our dignity and our purpose. That more times than not, we've got lies in our heads about those and it usually goes like, um, you're nobody, that's a shot against your identity. You're worthless, that's a a shot against your dignity because you're made in God's image and have infinite worth and your purpose is like you don't think you have a point your, your life has no meaning no one would notice if you weren't here those are all just fat lies that cause us to live short of who God has made us to be whole and free and with him and for him in his presence and overflowing that being in the kingdom in our lives and I love the reality that we can be informed. It's, in, it's biblical. It's in the Bible to encourage one another, to spur one another on. But I love the way that I love the way that we're about to dismiss kids to connect kids. I mean, above all, above all, that was all but like hitting me with a two by four in the head, which probably would have been what. Would have been taken next. You probably were giving me all kinds of cues over there, 
and I'm just in Mars here or something. Yeah, so Connect Kids? They probably already left. Okay, okay, good. Oh, oh, yes. But um, informative from this boot camp thing that it does take that kind of encouragement, that kind of positivity to, to not give up, to not quit, to not relent, to not pull back and, and stay where this is the insane part about of it. We'll just stay in that unhealth. We'll stay back knowing we're short of what we could be, but for some reason we just lose the courage, which is what encouragement is all about, is putting that inside someone else, putting courage in them to go after and live the life that God's calling them to. So we're taking a two-minute drill that's been part of our boot camp training. We're taking a two-minute drill to connect with one another. So get up and talk with someone in this room and encourage them. Like from your, your heart, encourage them that they're here. Encourage them that they're on this journey. Maybe this doesn't have to be someone you don't know, but go to someone that you feel like might need encouragement to, to just keep it going, to focus in, that kind of stuff. So, ready? Mark, set, go. Two minutes. I have a good friend. His name is Spencer Lohman. Um, I met him while he was stu still a student at Indiana Wesleyan. I was doing a lot of... Uh, was while I was working for the headquarters of Wesley Church and spending a lot of time on campuses, ultimately recruiting young leaders into church planting. And Spencer Lohman is a fantastic one. He's in Charlotte, North Carolina now, but uh, he had just posted yesterday on Facebook a uh, real good teaching on discipleship in the church. And I had this quote within it. It says, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately each church will be evaluated by only one thing. Think of everything happening this morning, think of everything happening in the season, think of our history and the story of Wesleyan Community Church and all, all the great things that have happened. Only one is ultimately what everything is gonna be evaluated by. It's disciples. Your church is only as good as its disciples. It does not matter how good your praise and worship are your preaching is <laughs> what? Yeah. What? that's a good thing right <laughs> programs or property so yeah your praise your preaching your programs your property so what if your disciples are passive needy consumeristic and not moving in the direction of radical obedience, your church is not good. Wow. Spencer Lohman, the punk. <laughs> He's one of those young college kids. Punk? Actually, this was the clip of someone else speaking that he was referring to in it. But I mean, I love, it doesn't go on. It just, your church is it's not good. Everything God made was good. That's all, all we're shooting for. We're very good. When something is not good, there's something radically wrong. And it's that we're not disciples who are making disciples. Technically, then, we're actually not the church if we're not doing that. That's what the heart of this series is about, is our mission and this mission that we really kind of discovered of what do we have to give ourselves to? If this has been our history, if this has been our story, if this is our moment, what does our tomorrow need to be focused on if this is true? And our mission, how we're gonna say the Great Commission moving forward is we're gonna create a disciple-making, leader-raising, church-multiplying movement like Jesus did. That's, that's therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'll be with you to the very end of the age. That's, that's all we're saying when we say that's what we have to do radically. With radical obedience, we have to go after that. Make disciples, raise leaders, multiply churches. Create a culture that, that, that's the normative behavior of everyone who comes into it. What's noticeable about those who actually fall into it accidentally is they can tell, man, the culture of that place is disciple-making, leader-raising, church-multiplying, and they're doing it like Jesus did it. 
because it's how he lived his whole life. It's what he came to do on this earth was to live a life in front of us that modeled what we would become when we would become the church in this world and do his work and do his will. So our vision of the great commandment, and this is just taking what is the general thoughts and language of this stuff and then personalizing so it does something in us. It's like a prayer that we're crying out for God to do this in us. Yeah, love God and your neighbor, but like some of the language, if you've been to some of the vision gatherings and stuff, is this, we, we have to like see, we want to see this culture of radical devotion to Christ, ruthless commitment to loving one another, and a relentless dedication to reaching others. That's what it's going to take. How are we going to love God and our neighbor in this place? Radically. We're going to be radically devoted to Jesus. How are we going to love our neighbor? You have two kinds of neighbors. Those who know Christ and those who don't yet. With those who do, we'll be ruthless with them. To prod them on, to spur them, to encourage them, to help them keep becoming who Jesus wants them to be. To be radically disciplined and obedient to his calling and leading a life that is so abnormal to the culture of this world. Anyone who is following Christ and you can't tell isn't following Christ. At best, they're like a cultural Christian that has some label because of something they do at some time during their week that is a, a merit badge or something. It, it has to be lived and noticed to be there. And we need people being like ruthless. Jesus was ruthless with the disciples. He loved them, but it was to help them be who they were created to be. And that takes some calling people up and calling people out and calling people in like we've talked about through the series. The only other neighbor is those who haven't found it yet. And let's be relentless. Let's be relentless in going after that neighbor to reach them. And offer the story, offer the relationship we have with the Father, offer what we found, what we've discovered, to, that they would find the same. That's just the great commandment. That's just trying to keep it in the front of our heads all the time. And the great commission, yeah, make disciples like Jesus did. How did he do that? If we just look at the life of Peter, he discipled him, he raised him as a leader, and he started his church with his life. He was the rock that it all started on. Turn to your neighbor and say, hi, Peter. Hi, Peter. Or Patricia. Is that the female? Patricia, Peter. That, that's what Jesus, he wants you to be, a radically devoted follower of him. He wants you to ruthlessly commit to loving others, one another. And he wants you to be relentlessly dedicated to reaching others with your life. That you would lay it down so that they could be lifted up. And just because we're not going to leave it up there in the clouds of those kind of statements and those kinds of phrases that we can know, how do you love God? How do you show that radical devotion to Christ? It's in your worship and in your growth. It's to what level are you being obedient and are you sacrificing and being surrendered and are you in the word and is your life being dedicated to prayer and you're upping that bar in your life all the time? And loving your neighbor is this like serving his cause. We sharpen one another. And we reach by sharing our life and then multiplying his and others. Again, this is training. This is boot camp. This is a teaching outline. And we've gone in each week. There's a teaching passage that goes with each of these that captures the heart biblically. And in Jesus' life, what each of these look like and should mean for us as the body. There's memory verses that go with each of that, tools. We should, if anyone built a garage during the course of this series? Because we've been given out so many tools, you could need an extra garage at home to store them all. Passages, memory verses, the tools, and the daily application of getting better at spending daily time with God. If we don't do that, we won't do anything. And we can spend so much time doing so many other things that aren't going to matter in the end because we're not being disciples. Today is the last characteristic, multiplying his life. So if we're going to reach other people, we share our faith like Jesus did when he called Zacchaeus down. When he saw him, he encountered him, and then he went into his world. And it was just his presence in his world, seeing him and acknowledging him, that he found faith. 
with Jesus basically saying nothing. Most people know everything. It's in their heart, it's in their soul, it's in their mind. Eternity has been put in the hearts of men and women that God created us all. And that is in us. That if any, really, that I'm sure that is how you found Christ. You ended up in God's presence and he just permeated every cell of your body. And you broke down. And you gave up. And you surrendered. If God's presence is in us and we're around others in those broken spots and places and moments, God will just... Do the Zacchaeus thing and he sold everything and turned from his ways and found Christ and then started to live for him. He shared his life and then the multiplication of his life is in the lifelong journey. We're not looking for converts that say a prayer and then whoever knows what happens to them after that, that they're invited into a life-on-life -life journey that Jesus invited the disciples in ultimately to tell them about the Heavenly Father that's what Jesus was always teaching the disciples about, of what the Father was like and what the kingdom of God was like. The Father and the kingdom and showing people what that was and how you get there and what that experience is like. So the multiplying of his life is this ultimate disciple, like disciple somebody. I invite them to church, but not just like hope they come one time, but be alongside them. Have done seven things with them before you would invite them here because you love them as a person. You're not just trying to get them to come to church to get them religious. Like You've been moved. You've seen their story. You've seen their life. You, you're compelled to, to reach them and join them where they're at. And it has a whole life kind of thing, like picture like that. And then you keep going on that journey with them. It doesn't stop there. We, we multiply his life that ultimately is the surrender God, live his way, know the word, depend on prayer, sharpen one another, serve his cause, share their faith, and multiply his life. That they could do those same things or live this life of worship, growth, of love, and of reaching that it's all about. Because all those things then help us do the great commandment and the great commission in our lives. The setting of our passage, this is the teaching passage on the outline here today, um, John 20, 19 through 23. And really, I was just going to use the verse because the verse that actually says it is when Jesus says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. That's in John chapter 20. And many times when the Great Commission is mentioned like it is in Matthew, the John place most people point to is this verse in John 20 where it says, that's what he said, that's the same thing. Therefore, go make disciples because that's what the Father sent me to do. I told him to do it that way. That's how Matthew recorded it. John records it this way. It's just this simple. This is just more of punch you in the face kind of style. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Like how I've lived and I've lived dependent on the Father. I've lived for the kingdom. Like he sent me to do that and I'm sending you. You are my body now. My body was broken because this was after the crucifixion, before the ascension, where Jesus is actually talking to them in this moment. His body had already been broken. His blood had already been shed. And he's like, you need to be that now for this world. <coughs> Historically, I've been that, but you are the body of Christ. It's going to be dependent on your life. And all I started to do is read then around the verse that tips off this to see more of this context and see more of this setting and it just kind of blows up um, into our world and into our life. And I think really as a body, into our moment. This is how the whole passage reads. Let's back up, yeah. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That's the Acts 1 8. A lot of times we'll talk about the Great Commission in Matthew, but then Acts 1.8, you'll receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. 
if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Have a good day, disciples. <laughs> I've showed you the holes in my hands of being crucified. I've showed you where I got poked in the side that busted the sack that the water came out of to know I was truly dead. I let you see that. I let you see this. And then I, and then I say, as the Father sent me, do you see how he sent me? Do you see what happens if you radically follow him like I have? If you want to know him, if you want to know the kingdom, if you want to be a part of his, of his redemptive work in this world and seeing that happen in others, you want to call, you know, chase after the life that you know I've called you into, do that. As he sent me, I, I'm sending you. You are now my body. It's like the, the passing of the torch. To what degree? To the degree of the forgiveness of sins of other people. Almost like it stops here. You want to stop? It stops here. You, you don't want to go with this? You want to forget the, therefore, go and make disciples and you just want to stay and sit and keep and retreat? No one else gets it. it you are the dis distribution source. It's only going to come through you to the degree that it, you allow it. That you, you live for it. That you sacrifice. That you take it on in your life. That just was like blowing up this passage and taking it. I said it a couple times in this series of, I, I think you get what that means when I say that's just such a, um, a dead sentence on paper. Like, so, and some of these are some key, like what I call religious verses that you can just hear those and be like, oh yes, I remember what that's referring to. Oh yes. <laughs> like, like a golf. Let's give it a clap. Oh yes. That's a nice one. <laughs> Remember that whole, like, as the Father sent him, he sends us golf clap. That, that's nice. And it's like, oh my word, are you kidding? That, like, what's actually taking place here? What is actually going on in this setting? And really, it's that time between the crucifixion and the ascension that Jesus is reappearing to the disciples. And again, they're locked in a room because they're freaked out. I, I really I can't come up with a meaningful parallel story to help us feel like what that was, um, how how shock, uh, how much shock and awe and confusion that who they had just spent their last three and a half years laying everything down for, doing doing all this and expecting him to be their savior, he just got crucified. We forget that they don't know the rest of the story. They're in a room wondering what the heck has just happened. What has taken place? There's been so much change over their last three and a half years of what they thought it was all about versus how Jesus retaught them what it's all really about, that it's about a relationship, that it's not about the religion. And they got so caught up in the religion and he was there to de debunk the religion for the relationship that this was supposed to be in their life and they bought it into that, and then he dies on them. Uh, yeah, you know, and I, really the closest thing I can get to, have I felt that, is like in my career world, in like a job promotion that you, you work hard for, uh, like a radical season, you get devoted to that, and you sure A plus B has to equal C, and so you give yourself to that, and then A, you do it, B, you do it, and then C is somebody else gets it. That's probably a, a nice picture because it's just like our career and our job front. But I'm pretty sure how we're supposed to identify with this passage is in our worst moments, in, in our greatest emptiness or in our greatest confusion. And I think actually if we're following Jesus the way we're called to, that would be kind of a daily, we should be having daily crisis because the forgiveness of sins of others is on us we're his body the message and it going out from here we're him as he sent the father he's sending us to be that redemptive relationship for other people
funny thing is, what I was realizing from, again, just going from that verse to then looking at that context is like, man, the disciples were basically going out of their mind, and what they needed in that moment was Jesus to show up. They were in that moment of just utter craziness. They didn't know, they weren't even hoping for that at that moment. All they knew was he was dead. But what they actually needed in the chaos of their life and the moment and their uncertainty and their fear is they needed Jesus to show up and the Holy Spirit to come on them so that they could go after the life that they were being called to, that they knew was true and right and what they were to live for. And I feel like, man, that not that the story? That needing Jesus to show up isn't that where we all want to be, at least I think we should want to be, is living a life that daily we need him to show up. We're not like um, hoping he shows up, because that would be neat. Maybe I can see him in Jewel on aisle 7, because I know I'll be there. Can I say, no, but like, there's a desperate need because of the condition of your life and the things you're facing and a good inventory of the relationships around you and the needs there what's going on in your community, what's happening in our world. Now, there's a desperate need, and what we need is like Jesus to show up. We should be living in those moments all the time. If we're following Jesus, we're not, we wouldn't even need to be in those moments. We're going to find ourselves in just some craziness of things not making sense. Needing Jesus to show up and then receiving the Holy Spirit to do the work that God is calling us to. And it really is conversion in the best sense happens in crisis. Because it's in crisis that we realize the need. Uh, this was one of the first quotes we shared earlier. One of the greatest failures of the church or our, of our life is to miss the crisis that is actually within your life. To keep living every day in this crisislessness existence thinking it's all okay, that's actually just delusional. You aren't watching your life. You're not paying attention to people around you. You're not looking at who's up in the tree when you walk by on your daily path like we talked about last week. If we were, there would be, man, this radical need for Jesus to show up and we'd be desperate for something to help us you know, live the life that we're being called to, which would be the Holy Spirit within us and the power of the Holy Spirit to, to chase after that, to have the courage and to live it out. So it seemed amazing to me this week that we would be doing communion to conclude the series because communion is about bringing all of our lives in the moment of your life that you're currently leading and getting that in front of you to truthfully look into crisis. And if it, if it doesn't appear to be crisis, look a little further. Just look a little bit deeper. And then to need Jesus in it is why I think it was more than Jesus gave that as a practice because he knew the disciples would need it. Because if they didn't keep up that practice, they wouldn't be able to make sense of their life. They would forget about it all and they would just drift into the culture. But this practice and sacrament of communion is to do this in remembrance of Jesus and his life and how he lived and what he said. And what he said was, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you to be that in the world. First John 5, 11 and 12, I memorized early on. Verse 13, I've added since then just because it gives the purpose of the first couple of verses. The series that we start in October will actually kick off with this verse and uh, just establishes the relationship that we are to have with God. Um, again, I was raised Catholic, had a, a love and affection relationship with God, grew up loving God, trying not to sin. My junior year had definitely a faith moment of the clarity of Christ um, in my life. Um, but it was, again, I had become, after being a high school teacher, went into youth ministry, and it was in youth ministry that I got discipled and started memorizing God's word. 
and this was one of the first verses that I memorized that just brought the power uh, to, actually I would call it like the power to my life because I, I knew that I knew that I knew what I knew. And what I was living was because of what I knew that I knew that I knew so my life could have some traction now in what I believed and some of the emotions that I was going through. But this is the verse. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Who does not have the son of God does not have life. Verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know you have life. That's, that's it. God has given us et eternal life. The life that we are all after is possible. It's accessible. And that life is found only in his son. And I, I hope from this series we get it, that it's not this, when we have the son, it's not just this accepting as this dashboard Jesus that we then put on our dashboard and keep driving the way we've been driving through our life. But when you have the Son, it means everything we've been talking about this whole series. That's what's pumping through your veins. That's what you accept. His life for yours. It was given for you. So you, you, you take your life and then you're grateful for it and you live it the way that we're called to live it. And Because then you have life. Then you come alive like you were created to be. You have to have the Son for that to happen. You have to know the Son. For that to happen. You have to know how he lived. So you can know that that's the way to live. Because that's how you find what you're looking for. And if you don't have the son. Oh. Oh my heartbreak. For someone who doesn't have the son. Because they're after the same life. They have no shot. They have no shot. Of finding it. If you know these things, then you can know that you have that. And then you can be commissioned to be empowered to live that with all the hope in the world. I think that's what Jesus wanted in the minds of the, of the disciples. When he broke bread with them, that's what, this is what he wanted them remembering and centering and focusing their whole life on. These are Paul's words. For what I receive from the Lord is what I pass on to you. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant this is how the new relationship that you can have with God, the, the life that you're after, is possible through this blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Of uh, communion as again just that sacrament that is that sign for us and I really think growing up Catholic that the, the experience and that was of giving my life to Christ over and over again getting the, the clarity of his body and his blood and that comments that I just love that I love the pattern of it but I love it when it's fresh and it's new and it, it gives life Making a decision for Christ is, I think, can become a funny thing in the church and with religion and things like that, but to me it's these kind of moments is what matter. Is when we're in, in the body and as the body and we just we hear God and we hear his voice and we respond inwardly. And I love that communion gives us an outward acting of that. 
And I also believe there's, again, differing levels of getting it and understanding it and stuff like that, that today, I believe in here that there would be some of us, just a number that, like a first time commitment to Christ would have been made just with the gospel and the word and what Jesus calls us into, to, to have the son, to have life. That if you're someone like that today, that you've been doing this for some time, but this seems different, that talk to me after the service. Let's meet this week. Let's, let's talk. Let's get into a discipleship connection and relationship so that there's not this confusion of, well, I think I did, and I go, I go and I keep going. But no, that you have the Son, and you, you do have life through that. So that could be a, a first-time thing to then, again, a heightened recommitment. And I would think there would be a whole bunch more of that in this place. But for real, for real, wanting to go to the next level that God's calling you to, you got to tell someone what's going on inside of you. you got to share how God is doing that and what it feels like and what you're turning from and, you know, wanting to chase. And that you gotta, God does not mean for us to do this on our own and to go it alone. It takes pockets of people around us. So I would be that person or someone around you if you're making a, a, you want to make a heightened commitment, or you feel like you just did to follow Jesus, get help, you know, in doing that. So, man, I can't tell you about the week I had of being like the disciples with just the desperate need for Jesus to show up. That I, I lived on. In some sense, it was a horrible week, in the best of sense, because it was crisis. Of faith and what is Jesus doing and is it for real and how far do you push and when is too much too much and life is going crazy that horrible like just as a sleep measure horrible we could sleep and anxiety but I love it I, I, I love that I know I need Jesus to show up and then in moments like this he does and I know we're good I know we're good to where we're going and where God is calling so, thanks so much for being a part of things here today. Has everyone taken their communion? No. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it was bad directions. I own that. Um, it was just kind of as you left, kind of needle. But if you haven't, let's do that at this time. Take the bread and do that in remembrance of his body being broken. Sounds a little sacrilegious, but bottoms up on the juice then. <laughs> Knowing it's his blood that makes our lives possible because of the forgiveness of sin. Oh, no wonder you guys, you felt tense. I was, you were wondering what to do. My bad. But um, next week, is that making sense to part? Core values are better caught than taught. So we're going to catch this hospitality thing. My family's actually going to be here next weekend. So, uh, again, you can promote that as seeing the ninja son and the Spider-Man son and Captain Marvel herself, my daughter, that kind of thing. could be fun. But Labor Day weekend, look forward to being together at the park. If not before, we'll see you then.